I grew up in an, a small town, Kuantan, along the east coast of Peninsular Malaysia. Ever since I was young, I've always enjoyed nature, going to the beach, going on nature hikes. But I've also experienced some of nature's wrath at a very young age. I remember at the age of 10, the rain that took place went on for weeks. And before we knew it, water levels started to rise. In the school halls that we were evacuated with, I remember one of the volunteers calling out one of my best friend's name. But he was nowhere to be seen. The following day, we found out that he had died in the flood at the tender age of young, 10. I can only begin to imagine how devastating his parents must have felt and the future that he had li that lied a hate. Now, I wanted to kickstart my presentation uh, with actually an image of um, planet Earth, the blue marble. Now, this particular image is very poignant and important because it's actually one of the very first few images that was taken of planet Earth by NASA. And beautiful, isn't it? Now, science has taught us, like, you know, even as we were growing up in primary and secondary school, we always know that solar radiation from the sun tends to get reflected back into the atmosphere. But because of this phenomenon known as greenhouse gas uh, warming, heat essentially gets trapped, thus increasing the temperature of our Earth. Now, we know that there are multiple sources of greenhouse gases from oil production, from transportation, from mining, even from agriculture through the use of fertilizers and crop burning. Now, data has very clearly showed us that in the 1950s, the Earth's temperature tends to take on more a mean, you know, very balanced bell curve. But just over the years, you can sort of see progressively that temperatures have shifted towards the higher mean. In fact, extreme weather events, such as the ones that I've described, floods, droughts, wildfires, they used to only cover about 0.1% of our Earth's surface. But in this particular century, that number has increased by 14.5%. It's about 14 times more likely in this day and age for us to be witnessing such catastrophic events. And my story is just one out of millions out there that have suffered this catastrophic events. And today, as I stand before you on this TEDx stage, the whole team was really about shifting paradigms and access. And I really wanted to make a case that carbon markets have a role to play. At COP29 in Baku, Azerbaijan last year, Developing countries have made a demand of $1.3 trillion to be invested in climate mitigation and climate adaptation. But we were nowhere close to meeting that target. If anything, only $300 billion was committed. So this is where we stand now in terms of reality. There are huge gaps in climate financing. You can see from climate mitigation alone, like there's a shot for 66%. Climate mitigation deals with what are the opportunities to cut down or to reduce emissions. Climate adaptation, on the other hand, is assuming that temperatures are already increasing beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius, and what can we do in order to curb the catastrophic events? And the shortfall there comes up to about 91% at max. So where does this really bring us? As I've mentioned, the idea that I want to put forth today is carbon markets is one of the solutions to close off this financing gap. And the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, makes it very clear that this decade alone is a decisive decade where action, where financing must take place. And where carbon markets can fill the gap is really, number one, in terms of resourcing. If we are going to bridge 300 billion to 1.3 trillion. I think we need to have innovative financing in order to bridge the gap. And secondly, and more importantly, is timing. We are living in a very decisive and critical age. Some countries are pulling out of the Paris Agreement, as some of you know, and they being one of the largest emitters. We have no time to waste. 
and carbon markets through the sale of carbon credits could not come in at a timelier manner. So timing is very crucial. We need to bring climate financing to where it matters. Now, let's go back to the 101 on carbon markets, right? What exactly is it? There are essentially two typologies or classifications, if you like. The first is what we call a compliance carbon market. So imagine, as students, if you were to attend a concert and there is a venue, there's always a certain amount of capacity that the venue can take in, right? Because of safety reasons. So an emissions trading scheme is an example of a compliance market. And the same idea is quite similar. If you were to exceed the capacity of a certain threshold, entities must go and source out for additional tickets. So they would have to go to the market to buy these allowances in order for them to meet the standard or threshold that has been set. Another instrument is what we call a carbon tax. A carbon tax works like a typical ticketing scheme. If you want to get into a concert area, you have to pay, right? So likewise, in carbon tax, if you have exceeded a certain amount of threshold, you just got to pay for your amount of emissions. Now, there is another type of market known as the voluntary carbon market. And as its name suggests, it's completely voluntary. So it's really up to the entity, could be corporate buyers, governments to decide if they actually want to venture into the carbon markets to buy credits in order to offset their emissions. But there is no regulation involved. You can quite clearly see, comparing between both a compliance and a voluntary carbon market, it is very clear that the compliance market seems to be leading by close to 899 billion just in 2022 alone. Whereas the voluntary carbon market, it's a lot smaller by comparison. Now, what exactly do you sell on these carbon markets? So there's this concept known as carbon credits. So one carbon credit equates to one ton of carbon dioxide equivalent, or CO2E, that is being traded, right? And each of these credit represents one ton of carbon dioxide that has either been reduced, removed, or sequestered. And where do they come from? Essentially, if you look at the figure that I've shown on my slides, you can see that they can come from either technology or nature-based solutions. So an example of technology-based project, direct air capture. In the past couple of months, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about carbon capture utilization and storage, right, or CCUS, which dominates the media. So essentially, a lot of these technologies suck up carbon from the atmosphere. But they're also nature-based projects. For example, if you're involved in replanting, reforestation of forests, wetlands, mangroves, all of this could contribute right, to the generation of carbon credits that can be auctioned onto the carbon markets. So the opportunities, if you like, within the carbon market space is immense. And Malaysia, especially, given the fact that we are actually one of the 17 most mega diverse countries in the world, the opportunity is tremendous. Yet, if you look at what we have done historically, there's currently only one project in Malaysia that is currently generating carbon credits, the Kuamut Rainforest Conservation Project. But if we were serious about protecting this asset, we must do a lot more. And carbon markets is one of the potential solutions to addressing this. Now, the carbon markets is not free from criticism. The media alone has had quite a number of critique and criticisms that has been laid on to the carbon market space. Just read the headlines above. Carbon offsets failing to cut CO2 study fines the environment, the empty promise of carbon credits, or bogus carbon credits that are a pervasive problem, warns scientists. Now, what's really happening here? Now, there are a lot of ecosystem players, right, in the carbon markets. Some would make promises much higher than they can actually deliver. There are some projects that have actually overstated or overclaimed you know, in uh, Karibu, for example, I think close to about 15 million carbon credits 
were known to be bogus credits, meaning to say that they actually did not achieve the intended consequence of sequestering or removing the one ton right, of CO2e that was promised. And there are buyers who have actually bought into it and using it onto their own accounting books. Now, do you think this is a fair measure? So in the carbon market ecosystem, I think we have to be aware that there are critique and criticisms that are often laid onto carbon markets. And there are risks that, that is involved, needless to say. I mean, I could highlight, you know, like many, like one of which that I've mentioned is systemic climate risks. So I've mentioned earlier that, you know, we, in order for us to achieve, right, a net zero state, we have to rely, right, on, on carbon markets. But what happens when they fail? What happens when the carbon credits that are being auctioned on the market did not achieve the intended consequences that they were meant to? Or what about reputational risks? Imagine if a campus, right, like, or university like UTM decides to be carbon neutral and they went out to the market and bought a million credits only to find out that these credits are fake. What would happen? What do you think would be the allegations that international bodies would have onto that entity, that university? And what more? In developed countries, we are starting to see litigation, lawsuits that are happening, right, year on year. So you have activists, lawyer activists, that are going out to the market and suing not just project developers, but buyers, corporations that are claiming to be carbon neutral. So a lot of this are potential risks that is happening in our backyard. And because of this, I think one key idea here is we need to ensure that there is high integrity carbon credits that are being produced. And it is only through high integrity carbon credits can we actually help accelerate the transition towards a net zero future. But what makes high integrity? So if you have been following the news, some of the standards that are out there, there are about 10 different principles, right, of what makes a credit high integrity. I think the first one is additionality. If your intervention, the project that you're going to embark on is going to happen anyways, a business as usual case, then you do not actually meet the additionality criteria. Two, we need to ensure that there is permanence. So if you were to embark on a nature reforestation project, and what happens if there was a forest fire, or if you have a project developer who has decided that, hey, you know, I've gazetted, I've turned a logging concessionaire and gazetted it for conservation purposes, but the following year I decided to cut down all of the trees for economic activities. Do you think there's permanence there? Clearly, no. So we need to ensure that nature-based projects are really lock-in, right, for the longest time. Of course, robust quantification is important. We need to make sure that the carbon credits are verified. And we, of course, need to make sure that there's no double counting. If I was purchasing carbon credits for my own use, I must make sure that my peers are also not purchasing the same carbon credits right, from the same developer and offsetting it into their books. It would not constitute high integrity. Now, there's a whole bunch of other uh, lists right, of qualities that is important. We need to ensure that there's effective governance, proper tracking, transparency, uh, as I mentioned, robust independent third party verification. But bear in mind that when I started this presentation, I've also made a case that carbon markets is a solution towards a net zero agenda. And in achieving a net zero, we must make sure that there is equity and justice, specifically for marginalized and indigenous communities. And some of the nature-based projects could elevate people out of poverty. So there are what we call co-benefits solutions to some of the carbon projects that are being done. And we are starting to see a lot of that happening in Borneo through uh, the Kwamut Rainforest Conservation Project. So there are co-benefits cool that we must be able to champion and get behind carbon projects. Now, this particular year is a very special year because Malaysia is actually the chairman of ASEAN. And if you've been following the news, there are 12 key initiatives that have been highlighted 
specifically from the private sector ecosystem. And one of it is the ASEAN Common Carbon Framework, or ACCF in short. Um, so as the president of the Malaysian Carbon Market Association, we are working with our counterparts in Thailand, Indonesia, Singapore, in order to drive up high integrity carbon projects. We are making sure that every claim behind every credit is validated and we are providing guidance on how that can be done. Carbon projects do not come cheap. So a lot of times, we are merely having a lot of conversations on conservation, but it needs to be backed up by strong financing. And we're also exploring innovative financing mechanisms in order to spur the growth of carbon projects within our ASEAN region. We're also making sure that we have a robust market infrastructure so that at the end of the day, we can trade credits, not just within Malaysia, but also that our credits generated from our country can be traded across the ASEAN region. Of course, we are also focusing on strategic communications and capacity building, because at the end of the day, carbon projects can generate millions of jobs, if you think about it. It's not just the project developers, you're looking at the third-party verifiers, you're looking at brokers, financiers that are involved across the whole value chain. And as I've mentioned earlier, there are also marginalized communities that you can bring on board specifically when it comes to nature-based projects, where they can convert their practices from logging into preservation or conservation. The work that we do is very important. And this might be the first time that I'm speaking about carbon markets on the TechX page, but the reality is change needs to happen, and it really starts from us. Our world depends on it. Thank you.